okay i think most of you are muted uh, so uh, so today's topic is uh, that uh, some some of the unknown facts about javascript so mostly i think uh, most of us has have heard about javascript and uh, and you know that uh, using javascript you can create websites and web applications so this session is not not something a tutorial or or a beginner session on javascript it is something that you might not have heard about javascript some some tech centrics uh, then unknown facts a little history about javascript and uh, what where javascript stands today uh, at the at present and uh, where uh, like the future of javascript so where uh, javascript will be moving forward uh, in let's say in next 5 years or like what other cool things people are doing in javascript so sorry uh, are you guys able to uh, see the screen transitions just drop me a message if any problems is there so okay let me put it here okay so this session is all about weird history the some of the fun facts and con concepts around javascript so we'll go through some of the slides we'll have some examples as well and uh, we have some demo so i have already spoken about me so i am working as a specialist here in the javel which is a uh, travel company in uh, dubai and uh, so this is the overall agenda so we'll have some history facts we'll have some uh, uh learn about some uh one second uh some of the weird facts about javascript and uh, we'll see some numbers like wh what's javascript uh, currently on to and uh, how how is it doing in terms of its popularity and all and then we'll see the future of javascript okay so let's go to the history first so i think uh some of you might know about a little about javascript history people especially who have been working with javascript for uh, some time but people who are new so you might not know much about the history so it all started with the world wide web uh, that was the the basically a collection or or a, or a, a group of linked documents uh, which was uh, created back in uh, on christmas day which was in uh, 1990 so it was started by tim berners lee so this person started the world wide web uh, so the term is a little confusing so if you say world wide web i think you also know about www so most websites have www in front of them so that is world wide web but initially the world wide web is actually a collection of linked documents and it was also a browser so that you can actually see the link documents in uh, uh in that browser so i think there there is a uh, a copy of that which is still there so i have a link on my slide so this is actually the original it might be a replica it's not the original but this is one of the uh copies of that particular uh you can say it is a website which had linked documents here so all these documents and it was more of like a browser so you can see here some document here and it had links to other pages so it's there on my slides you can have a try so that's the where the world wide web and browsers and all these things started so then uh in 1993 uh, there is a person called mark anderson so he founded netscape netscape was a company back then and netscape started netscape navigator uh, i think some of you might have heard about it so netscape one of, was one of the uh, first uh, popular browser that was started so by 1994 netscape navigator came out and uh, started to take the market share and by 1995 uh, it had like 80% of market share and then soon the people at netscape they realized that uh, they had to basically since it was a web browser so it was all about uh, having documents and pages uh, showing up on your browser so netscape when it started to get the uh, the market share and get more popularity they 
had i mean they wanted to have a glue language to make their sites more dynamic like say quickly you can do some animations quickly you can navigate quickly you can submit a form and all these things so at that time the option was not there so there was java around the java oh, i think you have heard about java so java was around that um, available at that time but uh, they wanted more something more easy for the developers so that they can get quickly prototype and get started so they hired a person called uh, brendan ike so this was the person whom, whom uh, netscape hired and they told him to start uh, a language or basically develop a language which can uh, help uh, developers uh, to quickly prototype and build uh, applications on the browser so brendan ike uh, he was uh, uh, informed to uh, develop something like a scheme language in the browser so scheme was one of the popular languages at that time so scheme is based on lisp lisp programming language so so brendan ike was told uh, to develop something like scheme in the browser so he uh, was under pressure and then he developed uh, the first version of javascript uh, in merely 10 days so which became javascript later so the first version was known as mocha so it started with the name mocha and then uh, so the, the development happened in 10 days and they released and uh, by 1995 mocha was named to live script and a lot of renaming happened during that time so so after uh, it was introduced so it was also shipped with the netscape browser so that first version of the javascript it came with the netscape navigator browser 2.0 and then uh, by 1995 december 1995 live script was renamed to javascript so mostly to follow the popularity of java the java was a popular language back then so they wanted to have a similar uh, popularity with java and then the renamed live script to javascript but let me tell you that Java and JavaScript are completely different languages. So although this session is not a tutorial on JavaScript, I think as we move along, so you will understand, especially people who have worked with Java. Okay, so then uh, came Microsoft. So slowly Microsoft was getting, uh, was, was having their ground. And by 1996, 1996 Microsoft actually reverse engineered JavaScript and they shipped it with Internet Explorer 3 and they called it JS script so Microsoft released uh, JavaScript uh, as their own version which was called JS script and it came out with the Internet Explorer uh, 3 so a lot of wars happened uh, between these browser companies and they so which led to the formation of uh, the ECMA group so that is the European Computer Manufacturing Association so it was a, like a standard body or a general body that uh, created standards for software so ECMA group was formed and uh, the first version of JavaScript was standardized which was ES1 and it was uh, the standard name was ECMA, ECMA 262 so that is the the, the standard name and uh, ECMAScript 1 was the first standard version of JavaScript that came out so which which meant that the companies uh, around at that time have to follow follow that standard basically a set of rules and then release the JavaScript language the browser uh, so by then uh, so in between ES2 was released but uh, it didn't get much popularity and then the first major version of JavaScript that was released was in December 1999 which was ES3. So ES3 uh, had uh, support for strict equality, exception handling and a lot of things. So for the next 10 years ES3 was uh, like it almost stood uh, the, uh, the history. So uh, there was no new version or stable version of JavaScript for almost 10 years. So ES3 was uh, the last stable version, I mean, when it started uh, back back in uh, 1999. So, so there is one more slide where we'll discuss uh, all these versions. And uh, then in the early 2000s, so, so a lot of new features came and then Microsoft Internet Explorer became hugely popular and had like 90% of market share. So they also contributed uh, to ECMAScript which was the the standard that uh, that defined the javascript 
because they had a, a monopoly kind of thing because they had major market share so they redefined and defined ECMAScript and uh, the, at that time the most popular feature that they released was AJAX so with which you can actually make HTTP calls uh, from the browser okay so any questions till now anybody any questions this slide might be a little boring we'll soon move to some interesting part but this is just the history so that uh, you know the timeline okay and uh, then in 2006 uh, something called jquery so it's a hugely popular library so jquery was released so john resick was the creator of jquery and he released jquery in 2006 so jquery redefined how people use javascript and helped the developers a lot uh, in terms of uh, like so the developers didn't have to play around with the dom and uh, worry about browser differences so jquery ha gave them a kind of an api or a framework which helped the developers to mitigate all this problem and then came uh, in 2008 uh, chrome and the v8 engine so chrome google chrome uh, the browser was released and it also had something called as the v8 engine so which is a javascript parser or an engine so v8 uh, was one of the fastest parsers and it still uh, is one of the fastest and uh, so with chrome and i think uh, we remember so when the when the first uh, chrome version was released we were notified uh, by google and then we all downloaded it and started liking it so from there on chrome became hugely popular and uh, internet explorer it, it lost its market share so till today i think chrome is the number one browser so these are some of the milestones in the history and then uh, in may 2009 one big milestone came in javascript is node.js so node.js allowed javascript developers to write server-side scripts so till now before node.js we all were writing applications and mostly our applications used to run on the browser so on the client side so with node.js you can actually write something uh, for example let's say if before to node.js you used to have your servers uh, written in php or java and your apis and all so with node.js it allowed uh, people like us javascript developers to write server scripts so all of a sudden we can actually have our server application written in javascript so our entire stack like the client the server entire stack could be written on javascript so that was one of the major milestone and exactly 10 years after es3 the next popular version of javascript came which is es5 and uh, although uh, from es5 i mean there is not much uh, addition to the language so then uh, i think in 2015 es6 came up so which was uh, the next major uh, version of uh, javascript so from 2010 to 2015 uh, which is the last marker on my slide so we had a lot of frameworks that came up so you had a lot of frameworks like uh, backbone angular vue.js ember.js react and all these things came up so all these frameworks i call it as a framework tsunami so all these frameworks came up and uh, now right now like javascript developers have like uh, un, un, um, you, you cannot count how many frameworks and libraries are out there so you, you will be lo lost uh, in choosing one of them so uh, so this is the stage right now so javascript has evolved from simple language to very uh, sophisticated language and now there are a lot of um, like uh, capabilities uh, with javascript which you can write uh, hugely popular applications and in fact all the applications that you use on the browser like facebook uh, twitter instagram so everything involves javascript and uh, they might be using uh, popular frameworks like facebook i think uses react so all these frameworks help us the developers to streamline and uh, develop our applications better okay so then uh, these are the other releases that happened so 2015 have es6 was released 2017 es8 2018 es9 and then the last stable version that was released was es10 which was in june 2019 
So uh, ES6 had a lot of new features like let constant error functions. So these are some of the things uh, which might be difficult to understand for the newcomers, new people. But as I said, like uh, we are not going into tutorial of JavaScript. So for that, maybe we'll keep another session. But uh, you can always browse uh, and then find out. So there are let constant error functions, classes, promises, all these things were introduced in ES6. Uh, ES8, uh, which, was came, which came out in 2017, gave us async await. So async await is another way of uh, writing asynchronous programming or asynchronous applications, which was better than promises. Then uh, we, in, in 2018, we had spread syntax and uh, rest operators and all these things. Then in 2019, which is the last table release, we had um, array, flat, flat maps, try catch, and all these things uh, like enhancements to try catch. So we have I have some small examples which I will show you in the upcoming slides. Okay, any questions till now? I hope you are all able to hear me. Uh, please drop a message or a thumbs up if you are able to hear. Okay, I'm assuming all of you can hear me. Okay, so JavaScript uh, throughout all these years, so it grew from something like this. So I think you, when you started browsing internet, you might have seen all these kind of pop-ups, uh, like very annoying pop-ups with lots of uh, blinking text and uh, shining text and so on this. So it grew from Java, I mean, JavaScript was of course used to build all these things. So it grew from that stage to something like this, like, like an application like Google Maps, which is also using JavaScript. So a lot of sophisticated applications now are built uh, with JavaScript. Okay, so here are some of the facts again. So Brandon Ike was the person who wrote JavaScript in only 10 days and uh, he was actually told to write scheme uh, language but then uh, he wrote javascript which was slightly different than scheme so i think some of the javascript people here they uh, know that uh, the double equals to and triple equals to uh, which is kind of confusing at times so even brandon ike was aware of the double equals to op uh, operators and he knew that this was a problem when he released uh, javascript so in case you are not aware, I'll quickly show you that. It's a simple operator. So I think in Java and all you have uh, equality operators, right? So similarly, JavaScript has something. So if you have 23 and if you do a double equals to, I call it double equals to because here there are two equals. So you see it's it says true because they are equal. But if I do like this, it says true again so if you notice here this is a number this is a string but still it goes ahead and says me true so this is actually a problem in the language and Brandon Ike actually knew about this when they released JavaScript so later they tried to overcome this problem by introducing one more operator which was known as the triple equals to you may ask me a question like why double equals to was not removed from the language that's because a lot of language a lot of applications which were already built use this operator so all of the those would, would have broken if they removed uh, this part from the compiler so this was another person who helped uh, brendan ike to standardize javascript so this person was the co-creator of scheme the scheme programming languages language sorry so he helped Brandon Ike uh, develop JavaScript, and in fact they have a they had a, a conversation uh, which was quoted. So he said that don't worry about it. He is mostly talking about the double equals to operator. So don't worry about it. There are lists that have five kinds of equal operators. So we'll just add another one. So he, so what he meant is that he the, both of them knew that the double equals to operator was a problem, and it already got shipped in the language. So the, he told that we'll introduce one more operator which will fix it. So it was the triple equals to operator. Okay, so the first uh, standard version of JavaScript, which was ES1, missed several key 
parts to the language like try catch regular expression strict equality so by strict equality i mean the triple equals to so later these were added in the es3 version of javascript so if i go back to my browser here so just to let people know who are not aware about much about javascript so if you open your browser uh, such as chrome browser so you can just right click on your computers and say inspect so this opens up the developer tools so we call it something as developer tools if you go to the console here you can actually start writing javascript uh, here like variable one and then print those values so you can do small operations like uh, additions and all so you can actually write a lot of things here so this thing here is itself a javascript compiler so you can run and test all your javascript here itself so coming back to double equals to and triple equals to so this was a problem but then they they solved it with another operator which was the triple equals to so you see here now this says false so this is triple equals to because there are three one two and three and this is also known as a strict equality operator okay uh, how do i go back there okay so uh, with javascript uh, they had a uh, so i think uh, some people might uh, know about flash and flex so flash uh, earlier in our browsers uh, we used to have uh, advertisements and ads and videos so we uh, before uh, html videos and all so flash was actually used uh, to uh, create those uh, advertisements and videos and all so javascript uh, actually had a brother and sister which was called as action script and uh, action script was used to write uh, flash applications and flex applications and uh, javascript and both javascript and action script were uh, defined by the ecma script uh, standard so if anybody has written action script it was actually very similar to javascript but nowadays uh, like flash flex and action scripts uh, have lost its popularity and uh, hardly people uses them so because uh, i think with html5 and uh, new versions of javascript and uh, html so they provide a lot of features which uh, help you to build something which is similar to flash so these were the logos this was flash and this was flex uh, so the other uh, uh, weird or, or, or kind of mystery about javascript is that Node.js wasn't the first server-side JavaScript language or, or first server-side JavaScript uh, implementation. So in fact, in, in uh, 1995, when Netscape released JavaScript, they also released a version of JavaScript which you can use to run on the server. So they had something called as Netscape Enterprise Server. And uh, that's, I mean, they, you, you were able to write JavaScript on the server. Similarly, in 1996, Microsoft had something called as IIS web server, uh, so which also had uh, like uh, ability to run JavaScript on the server. So Microsoft version of JavaScript was called as JScript at the time. So if anybody has worked with ASP, ASP.NET, we used to have JScript with ASP, if you remember. So, but these two things didn't stick because uh, it was a serious pain for the developers so for i mean even if you make small changes and all the whole application had to be compiled and um, and deployed and also it had its complications um, even i didn't uh, try to dig into that much so but it didn't stick these two things uh, so the javascript interpreters that you know the engines like chrome and firefox and all these browsers so all these have a javascript parser right so that parser itself is written in c++ so spider monkey is the engine that comes with uh, mozilla firefox and spider monkey was developed by brandon ike and uh, right now they have open sourced it so you can actually go ahead and see the code 
So the whole spider monkey parser is written in C++. Similarly, V8 is for Google Chrome. So the V8 engine is also written in C++. In fact, uh, Node.js, the server side, uh, like the server side uh, no JavaScript uh, uh, library. So that also uses V8 to compile uh, JavaScript. So both of these are actually written in C++. Okay, so the next uh, thing is that uh, I think this is again for people who are aware of JavaScript. So we, how do we write uh, or how do you insert uh, JavaScript into the browser? It's basically by writing script tags, right? So you might have seen this thing in your applications or if you open anything, any Google page or any, your, any website, you will mostly see JavaScript being added to your page using this tag. So, so uh, with script tags, there are two new, new features which you can add, which are known as async and defer. So this is mostly uh, to enhance the performance of your web application. So what happens is that by default, this JavaScript tags or whatever JavaScript is specify here. So that JavaScript, when it is downloading, the, the browser actually downloads the JavaScript, right? So I'll show you an example. So, so when it downloads the JavaScript, it actually stops rendering your page. So basically the browser is freezed. So till the time the script is downloaded to the browser, and it will execute that script. So meanwhile, the browser will not do anything because it is doing this, this task, which is a high priority task. Similarly, when you mention your style sheets or CSS files, so even when it is downloading those CSS files, the browser is idle, like the browser doesn't actually do anything. It only downloads that CSS. And then once it downloads, it parses the CSS and then whatever necessary changes are needed in the browser, it will do like updating some styles or repainting and all. So, but uh, to overcome that problem, there have been new two new features, which are async and defer. And by using this two, you can actually say the browser that, okay, so when you say async, so say this is your timeline of the browser parsing your document. So it starts with HTML parsing. And then once it sees the script, and you have said that async so it basically goes ahead and downloads the, uh, the downloads the script and it will download it asynchronously what i mean by asynchronously is that uh, the browser will still go ahead and do other work it can do so it is not freezed like it is downloading behind the scenes without you knowing about it so it will go ahead and download the script once it is downloaded it is executing the script so meanwhile it executes it will wait because whenever it's executing the script it can make changes to the page. So don't worry about it. I mean, I'll, I'll show you an example where you'll understand. So these are some of the high level terms. I think mostly advanced developers will know. But if you do have any question, please uh, unmute and then ask me or uh, just write a, write a message here. Okay, so coming back to the async. So it downloads the script asynchronously, like behind the scenes. So it is downloading behind the scenes meanwhile the browser is also continuing to do other things like maybe it can download more scripts or more styles or it can go ahead and render the html once it's downloaded it will say the browser okay i'm download i have finished downloading now you wait your wait your rendering part don't do anything go ahead and execute the script once you are done with the script execution then continue and resume your parsing or, or doing other things Similarly, there is another tag that you can use, which is known as defer. So defer is slightly different from async is that, so once the script is downloaded asynchronously or behind the scenes, so it will defer the execution of the script till the browser is done with the HTML parsing. So here the browser has finished the parsing of the whole page and whatever other task it had to do, it is complete. Now, after that, the execution of the JavaScript will start. So it's a slight different than async, but both are downloading asynchronously. If you see here the pink box, so both started downloading in between the parsing. So they are downloading behind the scenes. But here in case of async, as soon as it downloads, it executes, the browser waits and then continues. But in case of defer, even though after download, parsing is continuing, 
and then once it, uh, once it has finished parsing, then it starts to execute the script. Okay, so here uh, I have a uh, example where I'll quickly show you like how async and defer can help you improve the performance of your application. So for that, I actually created two glitch examples. So let me go ahead and open this here. So here are some, I have just some uh, code here. Guys, any question, please ask me. I hope you are finding it interesting. I hope everyone is there. Did you guys leave? Are you guys there? Leave? Okay. All right. Okay, any questions, please ask. Okay, so here uh, is some code here. So what is glitch? You, you might ask like glitch is just like an online editor where you can go and write code. So this is a typical HTML page. So if you see here, I ha have the HTML blocks and then the head. Here is the head. There's the body part. Where's the body? Yeah, here's the body part. So just some HTML. I'm not going into the details of it. So once I show you the demo, you'll see. And then at the top, you can see I'm just downloading some scripts here. So some random scripts. I'm just downloading some random scripts. And one style sheet here. So let me go ahead and open this uh, demo. So this is how it looks now. If you go into your developer tools, so you'll have a network panel here where you can see all the files that are being downloaded. So if you go and just refresh it so you'll see all the javascripts that are downloaded so these are some of the javascript which i was downloading in the script tag so if you go and see here some javascript so these files are downloaded here and uh, okay so so these are the files that are getting downloaded similarly if i go to my css tab so you can see the style sheet being downloaded so together, all this is making my application. So I can go ahead and click. I can do some operations and all. But if you see, let's let's do a performance analysis of this. So there is a free tool from Google, which is called Google PageSpeed Insights. So if you go to Google Developers PageSpeed Insights, you can just paste the URL of your application and it will analyze and give you a report. So there are like 15 to 17 pointers which it uh, like calculates. So here it gives you a score. So 97 is a good score, but then it will also report problem. So here it says that this is one of the problem and you can improve on that problem. So what it says is that it eliminates render blocking. So eliminate render blocking resources. So what, what, what does that mean is that all the scripts you see here, these JavaScripts are getting downloaded. So all these scripts even the style sheet, they are blocking the browser from rendering the page. That means whenever the browser is actually downloading these scripts, it is not doing anything else. So there's an opportunity for us to improve here. So if I go back to my application, rather my demo. So this was uh, the unoptimized version. And uh, if I go here, so similarly, I've created a optimized version, uh, nothing but uh, it's just the, I'm downloading the scripts using the async tag. So let me go ahead and show you that. Okay, so here, now what I'm doing is that I'm just downloading the scripts. So I have the scripts here, the same scripts, but I'm just adding an async attribute so i'm telling the browser to download these files asynchronously like when you are downloading these things don't stop doing other things so that's what i'm saying the browser so let me go ahead and open this demo so in terms of how it looks and feel it's exactly the same so you'll see it is downloading the same scripts and everything is the same so if i go and do the network panel and refresh this I'm clearing the cache and refreshing. So if you go to JS, 
the JS panel so you'll see everything is the same so it's downloading but let's do a performance analysis so I'll copy the new demo URL and uh, I do analysis so I think uh, the particular message okay the score has improved a little and this message is still there because of the CSS file but you see the JavaScript files have gone so that means the browser is now actually not blocked when it is downloading these script files okay so i hope this helps it's a small demo i'm not going into a lot of details uh, performance and web performance itself is a huge topic there are a lot of optimizations that can be done and it leads, actually needs a lot of study and a lot of practice so i'm not going into a lot of details uh, maybe sometime in future we'll have one more session where we talk about performance so these are two options which you can use with your script tags so people who are not aware of this i think they can definitely try this okay so the next uh, things from here on are small tips and tricks about javascript so we'll quickly uh, like use our console and then try out few things Let's, yeah sure so this async property uh, is it only for uh, downloading uh, javascript files yeah only downloading yeah just specify the async so when you specify an async the browser will download it asynchronously like parallelly so it is downloading as well as it is doing other things so it is not blocked it doesn't work for any other uh, type of file no uh, async and defer is only for scripts only for javascripts if you put async on a style tag or on a link tag it will not work Joseph, I had one question. Sure. Actually, the framework will create the bundle for the script file. Uh, you're talking about like React Webpack and all? Yeah, of course, React. And yeah. React. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, at the time, we can't add the script file. So, uh, like Webpack and all, they have their own optimization, like code splitting and all these things. So, the modern tools like webpack and then you have uh, uh, other tools like uh, gatsby js and all they actually take care of this so so normally if you are working on a react application so you can have something like i have a small example of react here which i was working on so this is one of my react app so in this react app you have a public folder here right so in the public folder you have the index page so if you create a react project you'll see with create react app so i think you use create react app right okay so it automatically creates a public folder where you have the index page and when the webpack is generating your production build which is it will produce here in the build folder so it will actually go ahead and copy this index into the build folder so you can modify this index html normally what webpack does is that it will add the scripts at the end of the body right it will add those scripts your bundles but if you want to modify this say at the top if you want to add any script or or any other thing that you say google analytics or something so you can add an async and download it so that will not hamper your performance so you can go ahead and do this in your public folder so this html will be then copied by webpack and put it into your build folder so it will do that for you all right okay guys i'll continue i think we might slightly extend uh, maybe 10 or 15 minutes uh so, okay so the next thing is uh, about again about this so these are tips and tricks about javascript and uh, i think you might know that javascript has two special types of data which is null and undefined so this is null and uh, let me zoom in one second Just give me one second. I'm zooming my browser so that you can see. Okay, so null and undefined. So null is one special type, and there is undefined, which is also def I mean part of JavaScript. So these are two special types. So, like normally in JavaScript, 
so to find the type of a particular data or a variable we use the type of operator so you use something called as type of so if you go here you do a type of and then I can say type of what is type of undefined is undefined now let's say I have a number I have a number so I can go and say type of my number what is my number uh, type it's number similarly you can do strings and all so here one weird thing about JavaScript is that when you say type of null it actually says an object which is actually very confusing so if you go and see type of null sorry so it says your object type of null ideally should have been null right because null is something which is a null value I think Java and other languages have null but it actually says object so there are reasons to it uh, I mean it's mostly to do with the bits and bytes how the compiler uh, uh, like uh, parses this thing so there is a uh, blog post which I wrote which has the proper explanation I'll share with you later and then you can understand about it okay so here uh, the second part is actually about uh, there's another operator with which we can actually detect if it's an instance of an object like for example say if you if you have a number which I already defined a number right so number 12 so I can go ahead and say is it an instance of a number class or, or, or a constructor function I mean so these are some weird things about JavaScript although this is a number but it says I'm not a instance of my number but if I go and create a number like this say new of number and I give a number let's say 13 now if I say n1 an instance of number it says true so these things are some of the weird things about JavaScript I and mean, that's what makes it JavaScript very challenging also very interesting so coming back to this example here that I just wrote I have a small slide on this which I'll talk later so for now let's move on and then there's another special type in JavaScript which is called NAN I think a lot of JavaScript developers might have heard about it this thing regularly comes up in our applications and uh, NAN the full form of NAN is not a number so NAN usually comes when I think you are trying to let's say let's say I have a number 12 and I'm trying to multiply the number with a string so it gives you a NAN says that it's not a number okay but if we go ahead and see type of NAN it actually says that number so it is confusing these are some of the things which are actually a little problematic with the language but then uh, these things have not been corrected as I said like a lot of applications are already developed on the basis of this understanding if they go and correct this a lot of applications will break so that's as it is then the other weird thing is that two NANs are not equal so normally what happens if you compare two same numbers they are always true right they are always true so you might assume that two NANs are also true but it's actually false so similarly with the strict it's again false so little weird okay so this is more details about null and undefined so null as I told you it's something like a null value doesn't have any value and whereas undefined is undefined it's also similar to a null value or something but in JavaScript we have these two special values so they behave differently like if I go and do a, a addition with null the result is one but if I go and do an addition with undefined it says then what happens is behind the scenes the JavaScript compiler will convert null to zero so if I go and multiply one with null you see it's zero so behind the scenes null becomes zero but if I go ahead and do undefined it still gives me nan so nan uh, sorry undefined whenever you do some arithmetic operation with undefined you'll always get nan but null compiler will convert that to zero so in your application whenever you declare a value or a variable say for example variable a and you don't know the value initially so you can always do or assign a null to it null is safer so you'll not get this nan issue here so null will be safe okay uh, and as I told type of type of null is an object whereas type of undefined is undefined 
So JavaScript, uh, I think a lot of us know it's a high level language and uh, normally uh, in Java or C and all, so you usually write int a equals to 12. So you declare the type, but in JavaScript, we don't declare the type. So we just write variable a equals to 12. And you can see the type of a as number, which is storing a number value. But later in my program, I can go ahead and assign a string to a number. It will not throw any issue. Now, if I go and do a type of, it says that it's a string. So you can actually change from one type to another. And, and that's why it's a high level language. You don't declare variables when you create them. So here I don't declare the type. But behind the scenes, the compiler has some types which is defined like numbers, you have strings. Similarly, you have booleans. You saw undefined, you saw null. There are other types, a lot of other types. So if I go and show you some example, say if I create a bool value, I can just say true. I can do type of a, which is a boolean. So it's a boolean type. So there are other types like strings, numbers, booleans, regular expressions, functions, and also a lot of types. I think once you start learning JavaScript, you will come to know about that. So similarly, JavaScript has objects. So objects are a huge part in JavaScript. So whoever is starting to learn JavaScript, I would request uh, that you learn objects very nicely because it forms the basis of your whole learning. So on the basis of objects, the learning that you will do it will help you to learn frameworks like uh, React and Angular and all these things, other things. So how do you create objects in JavaScript? So simple example, again, I don't declare or the type, I can just say, so this is how you create an object, curly braces, and then you can add property, say name, say A, and say, I can say ID 12. So that's my object. It's a very simple way. Then I can go ahead and print my object. So this is the structure of my object and I can go ahead and access properties a dot id. So I can go ahead and access. Now can I modify? So I can go ahead and add like modify the id to 13. So I modified it. Let's print what's the value. Sorry. So you can see the id has been modified. So as I said, JavaScript is very high level and very dynamic language. So you can go ahead and modify things. You can update, you can just assign uh, values to other values all dynamically. Like the compiler is very, very relaxed. It will not throw errors for a lot of things. So that's what again makes JavaScript very challenging for developers, uh, especially coming from uh, Java and other languages. Okay, what's next? Uh, so JavaScript uh, has a void operator. So whoever has been working with JavaScript, uh, they might not have heard about this. So what is a void operator? The void, we don't use it much. Uh, so it's just for, for like understanding. So usually I also don't use, I would also say that you also don't use it. So normally void, when you say void of zero, it returns undefined. So normally if you write zero, it returns a zero. But when it's a void of zero, it returns undefined. So similarly, if I have a function, so here I'm writing a small JavaScript function, which returns say number one. So let me go ahead and call this function. So you see the result is one, so because it's returning one. But if I go ahead and say void of test, so it returns undefined. So a void operator, Whenever you use with something here, or the operand, it will always return undefined explicitly, even though you have some return here, but it always return undefined. So we don't use it much. I mean, it's just a understanding. So JavaScript has something called as comma operators. So those who are working in JavaScript might not know about this. The comma operator returns the result from the rightmost expression. So if this is an expression here, so it will evaluate the expression. This is the first part. This is the rightmost part. So the output will be the rightmost part. So if I go and show an example, say uh, I declare a variable and I assign either two or three. So let me go ahead and print my expression. So it says three. So the rightmost one is getting executed. Again, if I go ahead and modify this, 
say 2 into 2 and 3 plus say 4 let me go ahead and print so it is 7 why 7 because 3 plus 4 so it always gives you the rightmost now if I go ahead and do more operations say 5 into 2 I hope it gives 10 so it gives me 10 so that is the rightmost operation it does so these are some of the like unknown facts about javascript a lot of us um, don't use it very regularly especially this comma operator we don't use it much just an unknown facts okay so the next thing is that javascript is actually object oriented so a lot of people who have uh, worked with javascript or may not have worked uh, let me inform you that JavaScript is object oriented so but the object oriented features of JavaScript are not very similar to or in fact they are not similar to Java they are completely different so it's more uh, like the scheme and the Lisp language so they are prototype based uh, object oriented so we are running short on time so shall I go ahead and show you an example I, th I think you go most of you guys are from at home so we can extend a bit shall we shall I show you an example of the object oriented feature okay one person says yes okay all right so here in JavaScript we have uh, object oriented feature but it is prototype based so what happens is that uh, each object uh, some of the terms that I will use here might be confusing so I think we don't have much time to explain all these features I would request you go and learn online but I'll just do the basics so what is object oriented programming so you basically have some classes and then you inherit from one class to the other so you are having reusability of features so you are basically reusing some classes and then features and there are other parts to object oriented uh, programming so I'm not going to that but here mostly it's about inheritance so for example very simple example so let's say I have a function I have a human class okay now you may ask me why I'm not writing a class syntax right so like a class so in Java and all you have classes so let me tell you that classes have been introduced in JavaScript recently like in one of the recent releases earlier how we used to do uh, object oriented programming was by writing functions itself but we used to use something with special uh, sorry with capital letters so I'll tell you a little about them so this is a simple JavaScript function but I am defining it as my class so in JavaScript earlier in the old versions of JavaScript we didn't have class so we used to have functions and we used functions as classes now I'll define two properties let's say this dot a human has two eyes so let me go ahead and say two eyes and a human has two legs so let me go ahead and say two legs okay so these are my the properties of my class so if you have worked with Java you'll know that these are the properties so this is my human class so how do I create an object of this human class so variable h so say this is my object so I go ahead and use new of human so this is how I create an object and then if I print my object so you see here it's a human object with eyes and legs so human dot I can go ahead and access human eyes and I can say legs so I have two legs so this is the simplest class and this very simple object that I have created again uh, so here when I when I printed my human object if you see the human object you can see that two properties right and then you have a special property here which is known as the proto which is also a short form for prototype so here if you open this guy you will see a few more properties here and if I go you can see one more proto here which is again having a few more properties so in a way it's like a chain so this is a properties it is again internally connected to few more properties internally connected to few more properties so if you go and see this diagram here you will see the like you will understand a little so here this is an object so through this link it's it's also a secret link it's it's pointing to some other object then again pointing to some other object then again pointing to some other object so this is how javascript the entire javascript 
like the ecosystem uh, it works so it's based on this prototype based inheritance okay so here i created my example so the human example right so i have my class now let me go ahead and inherit this class so how i'll do is first let me go ahead and create an employee class it's a simple employee class and i'll pass the name and on the basis of what i pass i'll create an object property name right so now let me go ahead and create a employee object so new of employee and let me give it a name say my name and if i print this object so you see here this is a employee object which has the name and then it has some secret links now let me inherit uh, properties from the human class so how do i do that again some things are a little weird in javascript if you i'd request you go and learn details about them and maybe i am planning for more sessions uh, in the future so where we'll go through this in details so now coming back to inheritance so how i inherit is so here is my class so which was actually the function so this class or the function has a special property called prototype so if you use your browser and you just do a dot and prototype it will automatically start to fill up so this is my prototype and here i can say new of human so this is the inheritance that i'm doing so i think in java you I, I forgot the syntax so how you inherit one class into another in javascript we used to inherit like this so this is the property that helps me inherit and then i'm saying that okay employees prototype point it to the human object okay so inheritance is done so now i go ahead and create few more employee objects say e1 new of employee and i say say some other name and let me go ahead and print my employee object so you see the new employee object has the name let me open this so there is this proto link see here it's pointing to the human class and it has eyes and legs so through here this link so here i created a link and this formed my basis of inheritance so now whenever i create an employee object it has the own property it also has the inherited property so i can actually go ahead and access my inherited properties so i can say eyes e1 dot legs so i can go ahead and access them of course this is a very simple example you can have functions here or any like large computations here so you can still go ahead and access those properties from your new object so here this is the basis of inheritance so you can go ahead and inherit okay yeah java uses extends keyword i forgot the syntax thank you so this is the basis of inheritance so you can now relate the picture to the code so through this proto link the prototype we can go ahead and add more properties to the objects and this is how the whole javascript ecosystem inherits okay so in javascript uh, you have something called as strings arrays and all this right so let me go ahead and show you an example say if i create a string say i create a string hello so this is my simple string i can go ahead and print but if i do a s dot it has lot of properties here see these are all available to me so that i can work on my string so if i use length gives me the length of the string s dot say some other thing concat you can concatenate with other strings say i add hello hi and then sorry so it has concatenated with a new string so you have a lot of useful properties which you can go ahead and use and these all are available to you from the javascript language like to uppercase to lowercase so i can get go and say to uppercase it converts my string to uppercase okay so coming back to the slide what it tells is that i think a lot of people who work with javascript might not be aware of this so i have put it here so you can actually go ahead and modify 
whatever is available to you from JavaScript language. As I told, JavaScript is very dynamic and high level. You can go ahead and modify the, the, the features of JavaScript so that you can actually use it. So as I showed you the simple example of string, let me go ahead and do the string again. So this is my string and the string had a lot of properties which are available to you. Now you might ask me like from where these properties are available to you. So just before this slide we talked about prototypes and how JavaScript inherits, right? So for string, this is the string function or the string class. So in the string class, if I go and open the prototype, you will see all these properties available. So whenever I create a string object, all these properties are available to the string object, just like the employee object. So similarly, the string object inherits all these properties from the string class. So here's the string class. So now, so my, my uh, say, let's say now I want to reverse this string. So I want, this is hello, and I want to reverse this string. So normally what I will do is I'll first search whether there is a reverse function here in my string class. So just to let you know, there is no reverse function for strings. So if you go back to slide, so what I'll do is now is that I'll add a reverse function. So, so that basically my string object that I have here can start using the reverse function. So for that, since JavaScript is dynamic, I can go ahead and actually do and add more properties into the prototype. So I can go ahead and add a reverse and it's a function and I can go ahead and modify. So in the function, just for an example, let me go ahead and print something, some random string. So I have added the functionality into my string class. Now let me go ahead and do an S. Okay. So now since reverse is a function, my string object should be getting the reverse function. So let me go ahead and do this. Ah, it, it, sorry, I didn't return anything from the function. So that is why it's saying undefined. Let me go ahead and return something. Say I return a, some random string. So when I say reverse, it's actually now returning me this. So now I can go ahead and modify my function so that I can reverse the function, reverse the string. So whatever I pass, I basically reverse it. Now to do that, it's a small little trick. I'll not go into a lot of details. Uh, that just to show an example. So we have an array here. So an array has a reverse function. So if you see array, reverse, it reverses this array to just, just reverses like it flip flops. And uh, now we can use this little trick to reverse our string. So first of all, let me go ahead, go back to my string here. So now my idea is that I'll convert the string to an array and then reverse the array and join it back to a, to a string. So a string provides me a useful function, which is called split to convert a string to an array. So here you see whatever string was there, hello, it has converted to an array. So now go ahead and reverse the array. So now I actually have the reversed array. Now, now how do I get it back to string? So you have something like, so you already have an array, right? So array has a useful property or a useful function called join, which joins an array into a string. So these array elements are then converted to string using join. So using the same technique, if I go back, so here first my string which I had, I split it into an array, I reverse the array and then let me join it back to a string. So you get the reversed string. So this, now I can use this functionality inside my uh, enhancements that I created. So I let me go back to string.prototype.reverse. So I write a function. So I'm customizing the JavaScript language and adding more properties. So the idea is to return and whatever is coming to me. So that is available through actually the this keyword. I'll not go into the details. Uh, this is associated with the current object. So whatever string is coming to me is referenced by this. So I'll split it first and reverse the array and join it back. 
okay so that should be working now so let me go ahead and create another string sorry uh, extremely sorry okay so this is my string let me go ahead and use my new function that I created so if I do a dot now it should be available to me and this is the reversed string so in a way JavaScript allows you to modify your classes and whatever is predefined to you so you can go ahead and add more functionality but there are side effects to this also which I'll not go maybe sometime later we can discuss so this is another weird thing about JavaScript so normally if you have a function and you declare a variable here since you have not used the where keyword this variable becomes global so I hope you know about global and uh, local variables so if you have a function test and uh, normally what I do is then inside a function if I variable if I declare a variable and let me call this function test so now let me try to access the variable outside the function so if I go and print x it will it'll, you'll actually be not be able to do it because this is local to the function so it's about scopes but one weird thing about JavaScript is if you somehow forget to add a var and you go ahead and call this function and try to access the variable outside you are able to access what happens is that by default it becomes a global variable so which is problematic sometimes because unknowingly you can expose some data to the outside world so this is where just keep in mind that whenever you declare something inside your function always use the where keyword okay so the next thing is the window object so whoever has worked with JavaScript might be aware of the window object so this is available to us window.location window.local storage window. a lot of things like we can we use the window to define global data and all these things so this window object is actually not part of the JavaScript language who provides the window is the browsers so like Firefox Chrome Internet Explorer all of these provide us the window object so it is not part of the official JavaScript language uh, then we have something called a set timeout in JavaScript so this is a small little trick a lot of people don't know that we can actually pass parameters to set timeout so normally how a set timeout works is that so you can specify some time and after that time like say for example 2000 milliseconds so 2000 milliseconds stands for two seconds so here I'm saying that okay go ahead and execute this function that I'm giving you so go ahead and execute my function after two seconds so if I run this here uh, where is my log okay so the number that you see here is an ID it's a timer ID I don't know why it didn't work I think I made a small mistake okay it's actually printing here you see here somehow in the console okay I think there was a problem in my browser it's actually printing this string here so if I go and modify it and something and I say okay after two seconds print that string so it is printing my string after two seconds so that is the uh, that is the that is how we use set timeout so a lot of I mean normally we use set timeout like this but you can actually pass parameters to your set timeout so what you can do is that let me remove this function here so I can go ahead and say console.log I can just say console.log it's a function reference I'm not calling the function I'm not logging out here I'm just saying console.log and this is where I can pass parameters so first parameter is your function the second one is your time so you can specify like 5 second 10 second whatever 1 hour and then the last one is the the data that you want to the pass to the function so here I can say hi how are you and it should print that string after two seconds so it's printing that after two seconds 
So you can actually add more parameters. It's a small little trick that you can use. So you can see it's printing all these things here, whatever is being passed. Any questions, guys? All right. Uh, okay, let me quickly go on. And then we have arrays in JavaScript. I think I already showed, showed you an example how you can create array. So you can go ahead and learn this online more. And uh, the named constructor, like uh, I think I already talked about how you can use functions to create objects. So in JavaScript, uh, like for example, numbers, you have two ways to create numbers. So one is just like a normal way, you declare a variable, just assign a number. Then there is other way to create a number. You can create a new instance of the number class and assign the initial value. So this is not very common way of creating a variable. Most, most of us don't use this, but it's also possible. And if you see the type of, this is where JavaScript behaves like little weird. So type of n1, so both are numbers actually. So type of n1 will say number, but type of n2 will say object because you are using the new keyword. So you're actually going ahead and creating an object. But both of them can do arithmetic operations. Like you can go ahead and add something to n1 the result is same even with n2 you can add or multiply divide whatever arithmetic operations you want to do the result will be the same okay so the characteristics of javascript so javascript is high level it is interpreted garbage collected so it has a garbage garbage collection uh, facility in the browsers it is single threaded it is prototype based we already talked about prototype based it is dynamic language it is a multi paradigm language and has a non-blocking event loop. So JavaScript is actually single-threaded, uh, but JavaScript is also asynchronous. So these are very like confusing terms, but are also very, very important. So I have very small, small examples that will clear these things. So what do you mean by single-threaded? It can only do one thing at a time. So till the time it completes one thing, it cannot go and do other thing. So for example, I have two console log statements here. Let me go ahead and print a console log two, and let me go ahead and print a console log four. So what is the output, or what is the the sequence of the output? Is that first two will be executed, then four will be executed. So two and four, okay. So that means it is going line by line. Now let me introduce an alert box here. So in JavaScript we have something called as alert where you can go ahead and print an alert message. So let me go ahead and put a three here. Sorry. Okay, so now what happens is that, let me go ahead and execute. So it go, it'll, the JavaScript will execute line by line. So it first prints two, then it shows an alert box and then something will happen. So let me go ahead and show you. So it has printed two here, you see here two, then it is saying three, but you don't see the four here. Do you see the four? You don't see it. Why? Because the alert box has blocked the JavaScript thread. So the JavaScript parser cannot move forward. So once I say OK, then the four is getting printed. So it clearly shows that JavaScript is single threaded. But then this doesn't stop JavaScript from becoming a highly, like, highly capable language. So JavaScript also has something called as asynchronous behaviors which also makes it like to do parallel things. So you can go ahead and do asynchronous and parallel and simultaneous things. That is why it makes it a very high level, and, uh, sorry, very dynamic language as well. Okay, just to give you an example of how JavaScript is single threaded and, uh, and how it can do asynchronous tasks. So we have like a small example of how the runtime works, like how the JavaScript parser or the runtime or the engine actually works. So this, like the whole, like the slides that you see and the examples that you see, I actually uh, saw a very good video on YouTube and uh, there I'll share the link later. So it was a little inspired from that. So, but in a much simpler way. So you'll understand the flow. So here, this is a JavaScript program. So you have three log statements. So as other languages, 
so it has a stack so the javascript engine also uses a stack where it will put each instruction or each line into the stack execute it and pop out of the stack so let me go ahead and show you that so this is the first line so the javascript parser is executing this line so it has put it into the stack so it sees on the stack it executes that line and puts the output on the output say say for example this is your console then it moves ahead to the second statement second statement is put into the stack and then the second is output so it goes ahead and continues with the third statement third one is put into the stack and then third one is output so now the stack is empty so all your javascript statements have been executed this is exactly what happened here in our statements that you saw here one by one it has put it into the stack and then it executed and the stack got empty so now in the second state second example that i showed you you had an alert here so the alert was actually blocking the javascript parser from running this line so this is what exactly is here so this is the first this is a blocking task so it's just a random name i gave and then the third statement so you have the first line here and then it was on the stack it got executed javascript parser now moved to the blocking task say so this task takes a lot of time and then meanwhile the javascript engine is blocked so it is not going into the task c so it cannot go ahead so that's a problem so ideally we as javascript developers we don't do some something like this but then you may ask like how do you do a lot of heavy lifting so we also have something called as asynchronous behavior of javascript or asynchronous programming which you use to handle all the scenarios there is a small example uh, in the next slide so i'll show you that before that another example of blocking task i'll show you so i'm opening firefox browser here and i'm going to the inspect so here is the console log let me go ahead and open an application here so this is the application uh, that that's our company application the company that i work for so you see the application here so i can go ahead and interact with the application right so i can go ahead and change things i can go ahead and type things and select things i can go ahead and click on calendar and all these things i can do now let me write a small example here so this is an example of a blocking task so again i'll write the simple example so so the line by line it executes it prints two and prints three so there's no blocking here now let me go ahead and add a blocking task some task which is very heavy so i'll do an infinite while loop so it will keep on running so you see here first statement the second is an infinite loop and then the third statement so first one will get executed the second one is very heavy so it will keep on running and it will block the javascript parser and it will never come to the third statement moreover you will notice that the browser gets freezed so it will not be able to do anything else so let's go ahead and run this so you see the two is printed here then it is not continuing ahead why because this infinite loop is causing all the problem now let me go ahead and try to click on my browser so i'm going ahead and clicking nothing works so basically it has freezed so a web page is slowing down your browser you may like like the only option is now to go ahead and close it so this is the example of the blocking task okay now the other thing is like how how do you achieve concurrency or how do you do parallel things since javascript is single threaded so for that we can go ahead and take the example of set timeout so in addition to javascript parser and the engine the javascript engine or even fact the browser for example firefox or chrome and other browsers provide few more blocks like call as the web apis and the callback queue so the callback queue and web apis together with the call stack gives you the ability to have asynchronous and concurrency and parallelism so small demo so let me go ahead and show you so this is the first statement here so the first statement will usually go into the stack and it execute then it comes to the set timeout so you see here is a timer here so i am saying that okay after five seconds go ahead and print this thing now you may say that will 
this particular statement get called before five seconds uh, so how, how that happens is like let me go ahead and put this example here so there is a small there is a console log and uh, let me go ahead and put a set timeout so I'm saying that go ahead and print my log after three seconds and finally I have another log which tells go ahead and print four now let me run this so you'll see the sequence anybody if they're guessing they can guess so you'll see that it will print two then immediately it will move to four so it will not wait for the timer to finish here and once the timer completes it will go ahead and print three ah what happened where's the mistake i'm not uh... did i make any spelling mistake let me go ahead and copy this thing No, you have missed the uh, uh, curly brace uh, in the function. Ah, yes. Thank you, man. You saved my life. Okay. Yeah, I missed this curly brace. So let me go ahead and execute this. So you see, two and four are getting immediately printed, and after three seconds, the three came up. So let me go ahead and do this again. Okay. Two and four, then three, three. So in a way it is not blocking the javascript engine is not getting blocked by this timer so it is going ahead and printing these things and it is moving on so it's a small example of concurrency so this is how it happens basically so the first line so i'm starting from the second line the first line anyways got executed so this is the second line so the whenever the engine sees the second line it will put that thing into the call stack so here is my function this is my function the function that you see and this is the time so it says that okay set timeout is in the stack now in javascript like set timeout promises async await all these are web apis so whenever the javascript engine sees a timer timeout async await or or any promise based code it will delegate that task to the web apis so from the stack it pushes that into the web APIs and it starts the timer. So it starts a five second timer. So this is the timer. So it's, it has started. So it is continuing like one second, two second, three second. And when it five, happens five second, then something will happen. So now what it does is that the JavaScript engine can go ahead. So the stack is empty. So it can go ahead and take more statements. So now it moves to the third statement, comes to the stack and it executes it. and Finally, the stack is empty again. So in the output, the C should have come here. So already A and C are there in your output. Now let's say the timer is now about to complete. And after five seconds, once the timer is complete, it comes to the callback queue. So here, there might be more instructions, which is waiting for the JavaScript parcel to execute. So immediately from once the timer is finished, if I go back immediately once the timer is finished from the API it doesn't go back to the call stack it comes to the queue it waits here and then there is something called as event loop in JavaScript again these are internal terms you can read more so the event loop is actually something which keeps on running periodically say just for an example say every five seconds or every 10 seconds it will keep on checking what is there in the queue and whether my stack is empty so if my stack is empty it goes ahead and ahead and takes the first thing in your queue and then it puts into the stack so that's what the job of the event loop and then now once it's in the stack the parser can go ahead and execute so it will go ahead and execute the callback and then it sees that okay inside the callback there is the console statement go ahead and put it into the stack and then execute it and done so that's how it achieves all the concurrency i mean this is very simple example but there are a lot of complicated examples with promises and async await. So these are modern JavaScript and this allows you to write concurrent programming. So maybe in some time future, if we have more sessions, we can do all this concurrency and uh, parallelism in JavaScript.
uh, guys any question i am sorry i have taken some time but uh, we are towards the end just i think 10 more minutes okay i'll move on and uh, okay now some numbers so this is what, what javascript is currently so it's the most run language on the uh, planet so like from last three four years it has been on top and uh, this is one of the chart the link is here so you can go ahead and open so this is one of the uh, charts that i took from an application called git i mean git hut it is actually called git git hut and it's it's part of github only they produce all these charts and uh, you can see which language is doing better so again the same thing so javascript has taken up so it's hugely popular now and uh, you can see the ranking so that means more number of developers throughout the world around the world uses javascript than any other language so what's in the future uh, so we have already seen that browsers from javascript basically has uh, been running from browsers to mobile phones from tablets to tabletops in industrial and even the tiniest microcontrollers all use javascript so in fact this is one of the very cool things that people did with javascript so they actually built a satellite and they launched the satellite in 2018 from india so this satellite was built with node.js and it's a nano satellite small satellite so there's the link here where you can read more now the idea is that like in future you can control this satellite from the cloud so like from your node program so if you are say they will provide you a dashboard and in the dashboard you can go ahead and log in and you can add functionality to the to the uh, satellite or maybe uh, observe the satellite and read its path and all these things so these are all being like now slowly things are taking shape and and i think in next four to five years i don't know where they will go then uh, you can do a lot of internet of things iot things with javascript so it's called as javascript of things which is also jot so you can connect your fridge you can connect your ac all these things people that do crazy stuff so you can actually do with javascript also uh, okay so we are towards the end and then i have a small problem for you so this is the last slide go ahead and give this a try and just drop the answer in the chat i hope uh, you're able to see the question so let me explain to you it's a simple function here and it's accepting a parameter and then i'm assigning something here and these are some variables so variable x which is having an empty array and then i'm calling my function and i'm passing my array and then i'm trying to print the value of x so the question is what is the value of x these are the options null empty array undefined or throw give it a try uh, you guys can Okay, anybody else? No. I'm waiting for the correct answer. Yeah, this is the correct answer, the empty array. Did you try in your browser or you? Okay. Okay, so what? I, yeah. Correct. Correct, correct, yeah, exactly. So what happens is, here, uh, I'll explain to the others. So what happens is that, so x is an empty array, and here I'm calling my function. So I'm passing x as a parameter, and here o, o is a variable which is part of the function. So o is a local variable to the function. So o variable receives a copy of the array. So it's, it's just a copy. So then inside I go and, and initialize o to null so my original x value still remains the same so it is not modified it's just an uh, just an empty array
all right guys so i have uh, like finished my slides and uh, thank you so much it was nice having you all i hope you enjoyed the session and uh, you had learned something new so i'll share the uh, slides with you and a few more links which will help you to learn javascript and uh, you can um, i'll mail you guys whatever mail you shared with me so you can go ahead and uh, try it.